Today on Lightning Bugs. Everything you write, the new thing you should write, you should be like, this is the best thing I've written. I, I, I don't know. Although there are things I will say I wrote when I was like 24 where I'm like, this is really good in a way that like, it shouldn't be. You get these flickers of clarity when you're younger and then you tap into something that's bigger than you and it feels like almost like you're possessed. I don't know if you've experienced this with songwriting. Totally. Absolutely. It's 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 like because you got the audacity to say shit you don't know. There's this blind confidence. It was like I was possessed and I had just like something like I was a conduit and it was like you know what I mean? It was like so fast. And like like those pieces of writing that I look at when I wrote when I was 24, I remember writing them in like 30 minutes. And like, it was not, you know, and it was just like something came through me. You write those things and you're like, oh, how did I do that? And then it's like, sort of like you're chasing that moment again. And yeah. Hi, if you're enjoying listening to Lightning Bugs, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It helps a lot. Hello, it's Thursday. You're listening to Lightning Bugs, Conversations with me, Ben Folds. Today's guest is Ryan O'Connell. He's an Emmy nominated and Writers Guild Award winning actor, writer, and producer. He currently stars in the critically acclaimed Netflix series Special, which he wrote and executive produced as well. His memoir, I'm Special and Other Lies We Tell Ourselves, that's the title, I'm Special and Other Lies We Tell Ourselves, was published in 2015 to widespread praise. Ryan served as the editor of Thought Catalog and has contributed to Vice, BuzzFeed, and many other publications. He's also written on shows like Will and Grace and Awkward. Ryan has received a special recognition award from GLAAD, G-L-A-A-D, and a visibility award from the HRC. He's making quite a name for himself. The young man has got a lot of energy. We had a real fun conversation. Check it out. Ryan O'Connell. You know, it's funny when I'm when I'm writing for television. I always say my rule for fights um, is that both sides have to be right. So like each barb that's being traded, it's like points need to be made. Like it's like, like I want the audience to not know where their alliances are. I want them to shift constantly. So because that's like real life. No, not no one is completely right. No one is completely wrong. So I just kind of write true to life experience, which seems. Harder than you would think, actually. It is harder. And, and I mean, you know, when it comes to songwriting, I think it's tough because people like songs that are laundry lists about all the stuff that they're right about and how someone else is, is, is wrong. I, I taught one time, I taught this little uh, uh, songwriting uh, retreat class thing, and I decided to get them to, uh, to bring out an email a message, any kind of anything that they could show someone who had really, really gone nuts on them yeah. and just been really, really, truly mean. And then, and critical, a big fight where they're critical and it's come to a head. Find that for me and you don't have to share it, but, but, but bring it in. Then I ask them to write a song from that person's point of view. Mm, that's smart. Yeah, and 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 the reason that I I like that is because what I found in myself when I've done that is that you can write from that point of view, but you'll always pull a punch somewhere because you know you're writing about yourself and that there was something that was kind of right about it. That seems to kind of work as a trick for me. Yeah, I'm sort of like addicted to accountability. You got to look under the hood. You got to. You know, I, I, that's the only way to be. Otherwise, you're going to end up in uh, the world's least compelling version of Groundhog's Day in your life. In your show, it's a, the, the, the PT guy kind of served as, a, um, as, as, as the therapist without having to kind of be the therapist and a voice of, of that's, that's a cool, that's a cool yeah, thing. Yeah, to... well, you know, therapy in TV and film is always kind of like, like Sopranos did it well but everything else feels a little forced so that was sort of my way of getting away with it you make it the physical therapist not the you know mft you were um this comes this is the second thing that it said in your wikipedia page i'm a <laughs> good interviewer i go straight to wikipedia what i love is how they've got your birthday it's it's either 19 uh uh 86 or 1987 there's mystery surrounding that so it says you're two ages at once i've never I know. seen that. well i love to cultivate an air of mystery for sure no i mean i think uh my favorite thing ever was when uh 
the New York Times did a profile on me and they said, correction, Ryan O'Connell is 32, not 29. (laughs) (laughs) And I was like, drag me straight to hell. Like, absolutely, like, read me to filth. Yeah, no, I'm 30... Four? Oh my god, I actually forgot. You know, after 30, honestly, it all sort of is the same. Like, I truly forget my age on a daily basis. It's just like gibbity gobbity goop. Who cares? 34. Why, what's different from 33? Who gives a shit? And it's so funny when you're younger because it's like, I'm 20! Or like, I'm 23! Like, all these have like such the magnitude, the weight behind these ages is so insane. And you can say and actually mean it that like, you can be 27 and be like, oh, they're 23. Because the, the gap between maturity on 23 and 27 actually is kind of wide. But if you've aged correctly... Uh, you know, I think you kind of level out in your 30s and who you are at 31 is typically not so widely different from 34. When you were a kid, here's, here's fact number two from Wikipedia. <laughs> you, were, you, were, you wanted TV scripts when you were a kid for, uh, for, for Christmas. Is that something you just yeah. said out of your ass one time or is that really, did you every, no, every Christmas you actually got this? It's true. I was um, like a moth to a flamer. I was obsessed with uh, scripts and with television writing. I loved watching shows with close captioning because it resembled the, like dialogue from a script. And I loved TV. And I was just like, I was writing little scripts in my notebook. And um, I was like, you know, it was it was that beautiful time in your life where you can be seen as precocious, you know. Um, and then you age out of being precocious very quickly. And then you're just like, oh, yeah, you're the right amount of smart. That sh- that's how smart you should be. You get no points for that. Um, and so, so yeah, I was, really, I was really into the medium of television. And um, I was drawn to it from a very young age, which I, like, don't know why. Do those shows hold up to you now, like the ones that you loved when you were a kid? Well, let's see. I watched... I loved Dawson's Creek, which is not good. <laughs> I, re- I rewatched a little bit of it in quarantine. It's, it is clearly a 45-year-old gay man writing dialogue for 16-year-olds, which like, you know, by the way, that, that'll, be me. that'll be me in 10 years. I'm dragging- That's my, gonna be you. You're, yeah, you're, I'm, I'm dragging, you're hitting there with a bullet. Yeah. I'm dragging my future self. Yes, this is-, a, this is <laughs> What else did I watch? I was obsessed with adolescence. I was obsessed with anything related to being a teenager because being a teenager to me was- like it, it, like your life couldn't get any better, you know, which is so funny because now adolescence is, you know, no one would want to be a te- teenager again. But you know what? I think I, I think I did a pretty good job at being a teenager. I would give myself like an A minus. I was good at yeah, it. Yeah, no, no, I give myself like a D or something. Why? I, I, what were I you doing? Were you just like a little shy boy playing with your little instruments? Yeah, there was that. And I just didn't get anything. What do you mean you didn't get anything? Like, what do you mean? Like sex? I just didn't like, like I, 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 it took me a long time to just understand a- anything. Did you have girlfriends? I did. I had a girlfriend when I was uh, 16. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, you know, I, I got that. I don't know. I just, you know, I, I worked too much. You worked too much? What are you talking about? Doing what? I mowed lawns. I, oh, okay. I, I worked at a truck rental place. I, I, that's hot. I, I installed car stereos. That's hot too. Yeah, I, so I was a, I was a little redneck. Yeah, where and, are you uh, from? Why, uh, North Carolina. Okay. Oh, that's gorge. Did you ever have the same uh, phase about movies, about writing movies, or you were yeah. always centered on? I really liked um, indie films, so like Clock Watchers, The House of Yes, The Day Trippers, anything with Parker Posey in it was like my heroine, Suburbia. Personal Velocity, The Virgin Suicides. Like, I was really, really into, like, Last Days of Disco with Chloe Sevigny. Like, that stuff. Like, I was 12 years old, and I was going to see, like, Last Days of Disco and, like, the Camarillo outlets. Like, it was, like, so... I I just liked indie films so much. Party Girl. I mean, I'm listing, like, every Parker and Posey movie, like, released from 1995 to 1999. That stuff was really formative because I think... I think I couldn't pick it up then but there's definitely a kind of queer sensibility in those films whether or not they're aware of it or not some are more overt some are more implicit and I think it just reminded it just kind of showed me a more fringy life I mean I grew up in Ventura California which is very kind of paint by the numbers blue collar beach town and so um, it was really important for me to seek out film that showed another life could be possible yeah, well, I mean, it almost seems like you're you you might have found an easier outlet 
uh, making indie movies to begin with than to knock in at the doors of, you know, networks and the, the world of television. That seems tougher for what you want to tackle. Well, I mean, it, it was, but not so much anymore. I mean, I think, I mean, first of all, it's always going to be different. It's always, I mean, it's, and it's always going to be hard to make a show that doesn't star like a straight white male narcissist living in Venice. But like, it, it is easier now because of the streamers. I think it becomes very clear where like network is beholden to advertisers. So they kind of have to be like, they have to, to use the metaphor again, emotionally bottom for like craft macaroni and cheese. But uh, streamers don't have to do shit because they have their subscribers and that's where their allegiance lies. So they're not beholden to craft macaroni and cheese. And so there's a little bit more freedom creatively. Yeah, it's not something I'd really thought about before. I haven't really delved into that world much. You know, it's so funny, like, acting in special. I'd never acted before. And um, I think I just had a, a bigger sense of empathy towards them. I think when you're a writer, it's very kind of like writer versus actor. You know, you're kind of like actors are seen as kind of annoying, divas, demanding, whatever. And I think I have just much more empathy for them because especially the ones that were acting at a very young age, that is just, to me, like borderline child abuse. I'm not kidding. Like, uh, No, I agree. It's horrific because your self-worth is now put into an adult's hands at a very young age. And, and your, self per- your perception of self is so profoundly warped because you don't have the time to become who you are because... You're trying to be who you think people want you to be. And that carries over into adulthood. So I, I can't tell you how many people I've met that where it's like there you can't you can't latch on to any strong sense of self. Do you know what I mean? Like there's not there's no there there because they don't really know who they are because they've been so busy being someone else for their work or trying to be something for someone else. You were talking about, you know, like different ages and sort of uh, your, your development, you know, like once you pass your age, you know, it's like I'm 54. Uh, and, and it's just like, I don't know, five minutes ago I was your age, but when you're a kid, every day is so important. And if you miss, yes. if you miss two months of being a child, that is a lot of development. Like that's a lot of building blocks of your psyche that are just going to be little soft, porous places where they ought to be built, I don't know, with like having a stick in them and playing in the mud or something, thinking about something else, not not being an adult. I think that's probably a lot of it. Yeah. I mean, I think like I started in special when I was 31 years old. So like the clay had dried and like I knew who I was, like my ego was what it was. Like it, nothing could really shift that much because it is what it is. I, And I remember, like, Jim Parsons, who produced Special, when I first met him, I was really scared to meet him because he makes, like, a bajillion dollars an episode on Big Bang Theory, or you used to, whatever. And, you know, in my experience meeting people at that level of fame, they're a little scary Jerry. They're a little, like, spooky dooky. You just never know what you're going to get. (laughs) And so I was really scared to meet Jim because I thought he was going to be, like, a laughter. And he was... The opposite. He was a fucking delight and so normal and such a lawler and like down to clown and like whatever. And then I realized that he like, I think he got Big Bang like when he was 31, 30. And then before that, he was just like a New York theater actor. And I was like, oh, that's why he's normal because he got to just be a person and got to just like, you know what I mean? Like before, you know, he was a TV star. Um, and I think that de- having that development is so important for your sense of self. It is. I mean, I've tried, I've done little cameo bits before and done little bits of acting and it's actually really hard work too. And it, it's, it's, it's even just remembering a line and the pressure of knowing that they need to do this in one take and move on. I, I think that's really, I think that's tough. I've done, you know, like like I said, I've got some good work cred. I've mowed lawns and and delivered wine and all kinds of stuff. And I would say being an actor is pretty tough work. And they also take you from your trailer and the disdain with which they refer to you as the talent. Yeah. Oh my God. It's like I've got talent with me. <laughs> I know. It's awful. Well, I think the way that I didn't experience that, thank God, because I was the showrunner. So it was like the, it was like the easiest way to have that experience because I think it can be really hard 
I mean, I haven't acted in anyone else's things. And I think I have a lot of, I, I think I have anxiety about that. I mean, I, I get like things to audition for and I just won't do it partially because they're bad, but, but also because I think I'm nervous about it or I feel really vulnerable. And it's like, it's hard when you've had complete creative control over what you're doing. Like I'm a Virgo control freak through and through. Yeah, me too. Virgo. It's oh, the are asshole you a Virgo? Sign. Oh my God. Love. Yes. Chic. Well, then September twelfth. Oh, good, good, good. Okay, great. September second. So I, I feel like being on someone else's thing. I want to do it, and it's a challenge. And I also operate from this thing of if it scares me, then I should do it. So obviously, I'm like much more inclined to do it. But it scares me to have that loss of control and that kind of level of vulnerability because I think I also suffer from this imposter syndrome from, you know, being someone who had never acted before to being the star of a Netflix show. I mean, it's not very relatable. So I no. think I have I think I have like a little chip on my shoulder about that and I feel kind of weird about it. But I need to get over you ever, it. You ever done a stand-up comedy? No. I, life's too short. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, life's too short yeah. it feels i mean i people have asked me that before and um i don't know i just it's not my journey i don't, I don't really want to do it no i wouldn't want to do it but i mean it's it, it does make sense for a writer especially someone who who, who writes funny stuff it, it 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 seems like something that that people just do because it's like works a muscle or something you well know? you know i think like when i do my college speaking gigs and stuff i feel like that's a form of it because like it's very heavy. It's a Q and A, but it's very heavy on the A and light on Q. So like, I take I take it very seriously. Where I'm like, these people are like, I don't want them to see a boring interview talking about whatever. I don't care. Like that's not what they're here for. They're like 21. They like could be they could be going out and getting wasted right now, but they're choosing to be in this weird auditorium. So like, why not make them truly lull their face off and just like give them a real show. And so I think like I get a question and then it kind of goes into a tangent about something else, blah, 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 blah. And I, I'm very aware of that, of the performance aspect of it. And I think that is my version of like sit down comedy. The sit down comedy. That's yeah, good. Yeah, I just like have a No, I mean, but you're, you're, you're funny and quicker than most comedians that I know. Oh my like, God. So it does make sense. <laughs> No, you well, you are know, like your well, you mind works found, like you that. You know what I have found about comedians in a lot of them in real life? They're not the, they're they're funny. sad. <laughs> yeah, I know. And it's so funny because I, I remember when I moved to LA and I and I interacted with a few comedians and I was like, oh no, is this what this is? Like, oh no. <laughs> it's dark. <laughs> it's pretty I dark. I love comedians though. But see, yeah, the, they're I, they're dark, but I, I do I relate to them. I I, I like them. But yeah. I, but I felt, you know what? I, I felt sort of like betrayed because like I feel like I guess I identify as a comedian in a way but like and so like what you're seeing with me right now Ben is how I am off pod on pod whatever there's like there's really no off switch and so like I I was so the the it, it was so jarring having that change between on stage persona and off stage persona and I was just like wait why can't you be conversationally funny because like I'm conversationally funny like and I perform funniness for my job but I but that doesn't mean I go full like ghost in the shell you know what I mean and now I'd like to hear from the peanut gallery if you've got comments or questions something to say then send it in let's hear it if you weren't a musician what profession do you think you would have pursued wow that's cool because most people like uh, say I'm so-and-so from Austin Texas and they have a question uh, that was really to the point. I've always said I would be a photographer. That's a hard gig to get. So I, I, I don't know if I could actually be paid to be a photographer, but my, my other dream would have been to be a photographer that does really intimate looking, uh, black and white, large format portraits of storms. I would like to like be in a, in a, in a truck, like as a storm chaser. And, and have to go out into a field and set up, when I say a four by five, we're talking about like negative is, is four by five, the kind you have to slip under the, uh, uh, the, 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 the blanket to make the photo and you only get to make one or two and you do it that way. That's what, that's what I would do. I don't know if there are any job openings for that, but I would probably do that. Otherwise, I don't know, maybe I would um, do something sort of mechanical. I couldn't be a doctor. Thanks for your question, whoever you are in whatever state that you sent that from. <laughs> Good to talk to you. 
you just really kind of start in your era. Like you're really a product of, I'm not saying you don't know anything, but I mean I like. I don't. I don't. Do you, do you go back and like watch the honeymooners or anything? Like, oh uh, my like God, old, honey, old what do you, what do you think I am here? Like doing like screening nights for car 54. Where are you? Like get a break. Like come on, <laughs> honey, please. It's just a but bunch you, of gr- gr- grumpy old straight white men. Like who cares? Right. You know? Okay. What about I love Lucy? No. No. <laughs> Anything from the olden days or is it all, is it all bad? It's not all bad. It's just like not my journey. Like Ben, like, okay. It's, it's not your thing. But Ben, like, here's the thing. Like uh, people like me were not in the media whatsoever. So here I am as a young boy grasping at Coke straws for any kind of recognition and like I didn't get it and now like I rewatch things that I was like attached to when I was younger and I was like ew straight culture like I don't give a shit so like all that stuff I just don't care about it's just like not for me baby and like I don't care I'm gonna opt out no that 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 makes sense I mean I, I I've hit the point where I almost opt out of anything that I just really really isn't like by a friend of mine or something that I understand like it almost has to there's so much shit out there that if you don't relate to it it didn't include you that it's almost like you don't have time for it is that the way you kind of yeah, seems or are you actually like I think so but also because like I think because I've worked in scripted television for so long I feel like I don't even watch scripted TV really anymore because it feels like taking my work home with me. I feel like I'm like, I'm already like anticipating what's I I can already see like where things are being seeded in the story and how they're going to pay off. So I can usually like predict what's going to happen. So I'm like, I like watch disgusting reality television that like fully feels like a lobot, like a lobotomy. I just want to be like tranquilizer darted out of my misery bin. Like that's literally like I'm. Yeah, looking, that should do it. Yeah, that. Oh, honey, it does it. It does it. I can't really watch well. that shit. I I, I, really I don't can't blame you. Stuff. I don't blame you. You know, it's. Uh, but it has a. But I mean, it has a. It has a sense of of predictability to it, doesn't it? It though? does. I mean, but don't those go on? A, it does, but it's like it's not. Re, it's not scripted. I mean, it is scripted, sort of in a way, but it's, yeah. it's not yeah, 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 yeah. like my world. So it's like. And it's so mindless. I can just go on autopilot and go into a vegetative state. Yeah. You know what my favorite genre of music is? And I want to know what your thoughts on it are. I'm a shoegaze freak. My Bloody Valentine slow dive, ride, Cocteau Twins. Like, that's like all I listen to all the time. I did a radio interview and I'd been doing so much of them on the road uh, to a guy in Austin, Texas, and his column was called Roadkill. And he said, he goes, this is Ryan. So this is me being you in a way. Like uh, I, he's, it, I said, oh man, this is, I'm so glad to be on this show about roadkill because we ran over a bear last week. And I told him that it was a terrible, it's true. It's a whole story about running over a bear. Right. At but the you end were trolling. The, at the you were trolling. I wasn't. But a I was bit. very. I was being really sincere. Really, I thought I was on a podcast about. I didn't want to know what the podcast really was ahead yeah. of time. Right. I just wanted to be dropped into it like I don't know a parachute. Right. <laughs> and at the end of the now you're at the trolling. End of me talking, now you're trolling. <laughs> you have to own your troll, Ben. You are trolling. I'm obsessed. This is about creativity. That's the only reason. The reason I do it and all my questions I was going to ask you have to do about your creative process. Well, I do have one. I was really I was really creative during the pandemic. I got a I wrote a novel in the pandemic. A novel. Yeah, I was Whoa. that I was that bitch that took the King Lear meme seriously. I apologize to everyone oh, in advance. Man. Yeah. No, well, I think that's amazing. Can you tell me what it's about? Yeah, yeah, it's coming out it's coming out next year, Simon and Schuster. Um, it's called Just By Looking At Him, and it's about, uh, a gay guy with cerebral palsy. What? That's crazy! Wow. Where'd you come up with that? You know what? I don't know. Well, I actually, I ran over this bear once, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Own your troll. Own, Own your, troll. your troll. Own your troll. And, um, anyway, it's about, uh, this guy kind of falling down the rabbit hole of various addictions and just wanting to be seen and validated by society that ignores him. Um, but, but I wrote it, I was really, really creative during the pandemic, but in a way that was, um, completely in the absence of any pleasure 
because it felt like there. Okay, so like as a Virgo, you know that the pandemic was our worst nightmare because it was complete loss of control. Okay, so the way that I could exert control back into my life was by working and for being productive and creating opportunities for myself and da da da. And also, I have to say, the world was a hellsca- hellscape. And I, I actually found it much more enjoyable to be in worlds that I had built in my noggin than the one that yeah. was actually happening IRL. Um, yeah. So the novel came about just by writing a thousand words a day. And I think the way that I, I didn't want to apply pressure to myself. And so I just saw it as a writing exercise. Now, of course, in my type A Virgo brain, I was like, bitch, I'm going to write a fucking novel and I'm going to sell this shit out of this shit. Um, but... But I couldn't really go there, so I had to treat it as like a fun jaunt of whatever. And then slowly, I just did it a thousand words a day, and I had a novel within like three months. And it was, it was, I, I, you know, I say that an absence of pleasure, but I actually think there was a lot of pleasure in that because um, working in television, you have to answer to a lot of people, and there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen. A novel is very much don't bother me, get away from me. This is for just for me. If I had not sold it, I would not even have cared all that much because it was actually truly joyous, the, the experience of it. Um, At what point did you did you did you sell it? Like like did you had the, the, the thing close to finished? Or yeah, it was done. Early? It was done and it was okay, done. So I sent cool. it, I sent So you didn't my, have to like write a treatment about it. This book no, will be No, no, because I because I didn't want anyone telling me what to do. I wanted to just do it the way that I wanted to do it and then they could pay me money and I would tell, do what they wanted to do. But like but I wanted it to be to be a very free writing experiment that again in the back of my head I really wanted to spawn a novel but I wasn't quite sure and I just didn't want to apply that pressure to myself so I was doing that I also was writing for another tv show I was in post on special I sold two tv shows like I was like but it was like it it was out of this manic desire for control so it wasn't I just felt like a hamster on a wheel so like as proud as I am to have been able to make money during the pandemic and to keep things afloat, um, I also was extremely depressed and anxious. And so it wasn't, it's like a very loaded, it doesn't feel, you know, I am proud of it, obviously, but it, it was born from a lot of pain is what I'm trying to say. And so it doesn't feel celebratory or something. Do you know what I mean? It just, I did what I had to do. I totally understand how that's mixed. Yeah. You did a, a thousand words a day. So do you kind of have office hours about your writing? Have you kind of developed a method that's... Um, yeah, 90% of writing is just knowing the conditions under which you're, you, you can work. Because, for example, like, I always tap out around, like, one. So I need to, I need to write first thing in the morning. So if I have a call at 10 a.m., honey, I'm gone, girl. Like, my day is ruined. I can't get the momentum back. The momentum starts right when I wake up, and that's when I need to work. And then, but like, I'll have three hours of real concentrated time. After that, everything gets fuzzy, and I can't really do anything. I can usually edit what I've done in the morning in the afternoon, because editing requires less brain power. But, like, I can't... I have to be very, very careful about... Like, for example, right now, I'm in book edits... So um, I can't do anything in the morning other than write. I could do this, but only at 3 p.m. when I knew my brain would just be mush. Mush for you, Ben. Yeah. Mush for you. Mush. Um, and yeah. so, uh, so yeah. So I bet I, I'm very aware of, like, what I need to do to get things done. And I'm also very real that, like, if something's scheduled at 10, I'm just like, well, I'm not going to write today. So whatever. That is what it is. You know, you have to be kind of kind to yourself. So that works. You know, you write in the morning. They say write drunk, edit sober. Yes. So well, I got by the time so- I- by the time one o'clock comes along, you're 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 kind of getting it together. Well, I got sober in the pandemic. It's funny that you use that metaphor because part of me getting sober came through writing the novel because I wrote a high functioning alcoholic as the lead, and I knew that it was a way for me to be honest about my drinking in a way that I never mm. had been before. And once I wrote it down, I knew I couldn't erase it. Do you know what I'm saying? Like once. Once I was brutally yep. honest through this character, aka a version of me, I, I couldn't um, I couldn't look away. I had to face it. So I got sober halfway through writing the novel, which was a nice kind of positive thing that came from it. 
Do you see yourself, you know, like, I, I think it's, we should all be writing what we know, absolutely. And um, that doesn't mean you can't write some fiction about, you know, Mars or something. There's something of you in it. But like as a songwriter, it's all expected to be, and, it, and it's viewed as autobiographical, whether it is or not. Mm -hmm. So you go your whole career doing this. At some point, you don't want to write about yourself. Oh, I found, I don't, I've... I don't have, I don't really want, I want to write a musical where someone gives me all the characters and I just inhabit the characters and don't mm. think about myself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ever, ever once again. You, you've written for Will and Grace, is that the Oh yeah, show? Will and Grace. I mean, I've written for a few TV shows, yeah. I mean, there's something really nice about being in service of someone else's vision and knowing that you don't have to be in control and you can just like let someone emotionally top you and be like, that's fine. Like there's something nice about being able to kind of um, not be so deeply, deeply invested in like poor blood, sweat and queers into everything that you're doing. Um, I get what you're saying though about not wanting everything to be so personal. I think I'm kind of headed in that direction because I've come off of a, you know, special, my book is insanely personal. Um, and I feel like, uh, I don't know, it just so happens that I'm attracted to things, I'm attracted to writing about things that have stigma attached to it. And it just so happens that being gay and disabled still has stigma and there's still a lot that hasn't been examined. So to me, as a creative person, it's sort of, well, number one, it's infuriating that like, I'm the first to do anything. Like so much of this should have existed well before me. But as a creator, it's almost like you get greedy and you're like, oh my God, this has never been shown on TV before. This has never been shown on TV before. This is so exciting and I can remove the stigma, blah, blah, blah. So I think like it's this, it's not necessarily so much that I'm like so curious with myself. It's just that I think about how much pain was caused by not seeing people like me on TV or film. And I see it as a really exciting creative opportunity to show things that have never been shown before. Certainly what you're doing is of service to anyone who's been uh, stigmatized and hasn't been represented. Absolutely, you're going to see that stuff. And it, it doesn't even have to be big. The other thing on my little bossy uh, podcast is I like to get my guests to give a, uh, come up with an exercise. It's a creative exercise. Let's see. When I think about the last year, uh, 2020, I keep thinking like, I just, it all smudges together, but since pandemic or whatever, I think about uh, the loss of pleasure, experiencing pleasure, um, you know, and there was a lot of obviously, like when people would experience pleasure, there'd be a lot of public shaming about it in terms of the COVID rules of it all, which I understand completely. I mean, to a degree. I mean, it's like those spring breakers, whatever, like those people are literally killing people. So I get it. But I feel like there was such a, there's such a, I think that now, especially with, with more vaccinations happening, I, I would say, um, don't be afraid to embrace pleasure in your life and to do things that make you happy. I have been fully vaxxed, but I feel like I'm still traumatized by this last year. And I feel like Every day I have to do something that sort of challenges myself to go out of my comfort zone that I've been in the last year out of survival. And so it's like like going to like the swing sets, which were closed. I love to swing. I'm addicted. So like <laughs> really? so I do. It's uh, like a, it's a it's swinger. Sad. I know, right? It's so sad. But it's like I, I really want to make room for pleasure in my life because we've been so um I we've been so missing it. And I think also like large like even beyond i think this is like advice that you could give even before pandemic times because i think we live in a obviously a, a hellhole ruled by capitalism so you know again talk about self-worth being tied into productivity it's really important to carve out pleasure in your daily life to do something that just makes you feel good whether that's for me going to the swing sets or for you just taking a random walk whatever whatever like I don't think you should feel guilt about that at all. And uh, I, I don't like to think of like the word self care because that's so obnoxious and like whatever. And it's also well, like, it's true though. Kind of this obsessed. is a way to get there though. That's why I like it as an exercise. So we say, you know, if you're the teacher of the, of the class, you tell, you're going to tell your students to take a, a guilt free moment. Yes. Every, every, every day. Yes. And like, and don't be scared. I think also like fright has been drilled into our brains. Like, I read this thing in the New York Times that was like the, how they're in America, there's a bad news bias 
which I totally relate to. Like, uh, every piece of news is like, good news, you guys. Like, blah, blah, blah. Everything's trending downward. Like, but we still might have four days to live. Like, it's like everything is just so catastrophic. And there's a lot of fear mongering. And like, again, I understand a lot of it. I think this needs to be the summer of pleasure, Ben. Now, you have no idea what I'm talking about because you've been at the pleasure center this entire time. And for that, I'm still enraged. I but, know. And I feel great shame through. about that. Well, good. You should. No, <laughs> no pleasure for you. Everyone gets no. pleasure except for Ben. He's except too much for of it. except for anyone in Australia. Yeah, yeah this is yeah, this is an Australia. He, he, he can take a break from pleasure. Okay, he can take a break. Um, but I just I think you know getting rid of the guilt and letting yourself be your most hedonistic Caligula self. Like bring it. <laughs> okay, I like that. That's new. I dig that. I feel like I have two modes, which is like hyper productivity, like crazy, crazy, crazy working, or I'm like nothing. taking to the bed, nothing. And I and I feel like my life has, I have no hobbies other than like writing. Like I like, right. you know, and I'm like, I need to have an outlet for other things because right. I don't have much. You know what I mean? And it's like this, yeah. and I want to have other things to turn to. And I, I, but I feel like my self-worth is so tied into my productivity that it's like, do you know what I mean? I, it's a hard thing. I, I don't know, but it's like, what is a hobby? How do people get that? Like, what do I, do I need to take up glass blowing? Like, I don't, you know. I know. Like, like I love to say, like, if someone says, if, uh, would you like to come over to our house next week and we're going to play some game? I like to be able to say, I don't play games. <laughs> I don't do anything. Like, I really don't. I don't have I a have. hobby. I don't play games. I just, I just work. I love writing more than anything. I'm, I'm not one of those writers, by the way. A lot of writers are like, I hate writing or like, or I hate writing, but I love to have written. I'm not like that at all. I genuinely love the act of writing. Like I truly get excited to work on it. And I feel kind of weird. Like I'm like, I truly feel alone in this because all my other writers are like, I hate it. But for me, but for me, it's like how I make sense of things. It's how I make sense of life. It's also another form of control because you're controlling the narrative. There's a difference between, I think, you know, something that's created from the necessity to create it, which is why something like rap music broke out so big when it did. Yes. It's like that wasn't being created because there was a schedule and there was a, a committee and there was a pipeline. There was no pipeline for it. it they had to make their own pipeline because it was – Absolutely, from the necessity to create, which is, I think, where you are. And yeah. and, and at some point, you might find, I don't know, like, uh, I, 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 but you might find at some point, wake up one morning and go, wow, I feel like I've kind of written it now. Like, I've written it about myself, and I feel like I've got that out. Yep. And then and that's the way I kind of felt. I mean, I don't have as interesting... Uh, of of like a unique a story, but everyone has a story, and I wrote Absolutely. my story for you know a long time, and then at some point I'm sort of like, wow, I want to write someone else's story because I still want to write. What do you look to like the last piece of writing that you did that was so personal that you kind of feel felt like it was the end of that chapter? Well, I don't think I write without it being somewhat personal, but I did notice themes close themselves out. Like I think when you're, uh, you know, when you're younger, something like, um, I, I think I realized in my era that, for instance, not being cool was the way everyone felt. And it's so like being cool just fucked music up for so long. Like everyone had to be the coolest motherfucker on the block. And it made it seem like some club that actually no one was in. There was no one actually in that club, if you ask people. So I, I had songs about that. And, and that's just about being, um, um, you know, being marginalized just because you're not one of the cool people. Yes. That, that played out. And I can see the last song that I wrote about that because it has it in the title and it. And it's like, oh, I buttoned that up and it was done. Um, I guess uh, a lot of things happen to you that are bigger than life when you're a kid. My, you know, first hit was uh, was a teenage abortion song, and that was very unheard of at the time. That's was not that something Brick? people wrote about. Yeah, mm, and I love um, thank you. And you know, I kind of did things about my life that were sort of veiled in that way. It wasn't as upfront as as some. 
I don't know. I'm, I'm, I, I can't answer that actually. I don't really know. Well, it sounds like you're never really finished, which is good. For me, my 30s have been so level in temperament and mood compared to my 20s, which were just like a, ro- a true roller coaster. I mean, this is like a tale as old as time, but I think there's real beauty in having my life be settled. In fact, that was one of the things that I took, that I loved about the pandemic was that I, I had a lot of gratitude for my life. And I was like, I'm so glad this happened when I was 34 as opposed to like with my, with my amazing partner in this amazing house, rather than like 24 where I would have been like addicted to Percocet and like not a, had a boyfriend and been really lame as a Rob and my career would have been kind of TBD. Like I'm so, like I basically, it made me really kind of take stock of what the life that I've built and how much I love it. And I think that's like something I'm very proud of, but it, the, it does kind of create this sort of, fight with creativity because it's like the cliche is true like those ups and downs do feel a lot of pain and then you put that into art I think I use art as a way to make sense of things and I'm not saying that like life now makes sense to me and I'm done but I think I have less maybe and you know I don't know and also like I if I say something or I, whatever I, I I have no problem saying what I feel at this point whereas maybe when I was in my 20s I was much more guarded and closet like you don't even saying I, you know it's uh it's well thing. and you don't have to be I mean I think when it comes to songwriting anyway you don't have to be in the middle of of pain to uh, uh, to write about it in fact in in some ways because of the chops needed to actually pull off a good piece of writing, you almost need to be through it and able to organize it and process it uh, at the same time. So, I mean, I would, I would posit that probably you're in the, maybe the beginning of a really long productive phase, which is at peace with what you're talking about and also gets to use some of your, because you've got chops now, you've, you've done your, hundred thousand hours of writing from blogging to everything (laughs) yeah i did my time you're almost jaded as a writer which is when you start to get good shit i think i think that's a really great time to be is like ah fuck it kid i've written this there you go well that's true i mean a part of my desire to write a novel was like i i hated my first book so much because i got a memoir when i was 25 which like good luck with all our projects like, <laughs> i was gonna that's one of my questions I mean, it's, memoir it's 25. so embarrassing i mean it's like it's like I, i'm just not proud of it as a piece of writing I'm really not, okay like it's like it's so my brain was so myopic i mean it was just like i didn't know truly anything and like i did it because obviously when someone offers you a book deal at 25 you're like zippity doo and i don't regret it because that you know now i have a tv show blah, blah, blah whatever all, like everything happened the way it should but uh, from even just a technical standpoint i was not a strong writer at all i had a, i had a strong voice but i didn't know how to harness it totally correctly and so i think from even just a like sentence level of prose i have grown so much as a writer and i think selfishly I kind of wanted to show that and I'd be like look like look how far I've come. look how far I've come and please don't read my first no. book you know please <laughs> like please like put that away you know what I mean yeah, it's been awesome talking to you this Has is it? the most fun one <laughs> yes <laughs> Yay. what a roller coaster we went on Dan oh man I know it, it was an emo- we've laughed we've cried we've lived a lifetime <laughs> I know okay so what I've been doing is I either take a phrase or like if someone actually wants to sing me something which has happened a couple times mm-hmm. uh, a musician like John Batiste gave me a, a, a piano riff which was almost impossible to use because it was all over the shop and I spent a week putting it together um, but the idea is um, if you have like I don't know you write you write for for television and and I don't know if if you think about the way you might write the same thing for a song yeah but does anything if I were to say pull a song or like maybe it's based on on our conversation what would so far can you think of what the title would be what a phrase would be what I can work with because I'll just I'll just start working with uh, with chords and stuff after you've uh, given me a start. Um, okay, episode two of the new season is called I Don't Like It Like This, and I like that mm-hmm. phrase. I don't like it like this. So let's do that. Well, let's get a performance out of you then. Like, uh, <laughs> get, musically phrase it like two or three times. 
Oh my god, what do you mean? Like, do I, Go. I, I can't, like, sing. No, I'm not gonna sing. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't do it. I can't do it. Do, is, does everyone sing that comes on? No, I'm not gonna sing. That's crazy. I'm not gonna sing. That's crazy. <laughs> That's hot. That's hot too. Clock watchers, the house of yes, the day trippers, party girl, anything with Parker Posey in it, anything with Parker Posey in it, personal velocity, the virgin suicides, last days of disco with Chloe Sevigny, anything with Parker Posey, released from 1995 to 1999. <laughs> Slow dive all the time. Cocteau twins all the time. Ride all the time. Like, that's all I do all the time. I like watch disgusting reality television that like fully feels like a, lobo like a lobotomy. Yeah, I just want to be like tranquilizer darted out of my misery bag. Because I want a hot tub in the backyard. I want a hot tub in the backyard. I want a hot tub in the backyard. Drag me straight to hell. I'm supposed to be able to start with their fucking houses and their upgrades. Must be nice, bitch. Must be nice, bitch. I'm supposed to be able to start with their fucking houses and their upgrades. Must be nice, bitch. Must be nice, bitch. Okay, the drama needs to go down like a second. You were trolling. You were trolling. But a little bit. Ben, you should own it. Own your troll. Baby, own your troll. Shut up. Hi, if you're enjoying listening to Lightning Bugs, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It helps a lot.